Oh, I'm gonna scoot down a little bit here. Or I should just tilt the seat back. Because I can. <laughs> um, so it's Christmas Eve. I'm in the Dodge, the truck. So a variety of things have come together because I didn't know if I'd get the truck back. I was driving along in town at 40 miles an hour. Suddenly, chirp, the rear end kind of locked up. I thought, oh, the brakes, you know, maybe a spring broke on the rear drum brakes or something. So, and then it, it kept rolling. So, uh, so I pulled over, felt the hubs, left side was fine, right side was hot. <laughs> That's always bad. So at that point I probably should have called a tow. But I was thinking that it was uh, a brake issue and that it had resolved itself, you know, uh, Either the the shoe came loose, or I don't know what. Anyway, I was misguided in my thinking. So, because you normally don't have axle problems on uh, big American trucks. I don't think, do you? <laughs> I, mean, I don't hear about it very much. So, I let it cool down, and I just kind of nursed it home. And it was making a little bit of noise. I thought, oh, that's maybe one of the uh, brake shoes that's rubbing because maybe it popped a spring or something. No fluids. Um, and I'd, I'd driven it over here over Thanksgiving. Totally trouble-free. So... Anyway, I take it to my mechanic, and he says, Oh, let me send you a picture of what we got. And the right side bearing is just destroyed in there. It's just destroyed. And he said it's, it has mangled the threads, um, which he used to put the bearings in. And he could not remove that half of the axle with his tool. So, so it was like, oh gosh. Hmm. So, uh, he predicted we would need a new rear axle, meaning a used rear axle. So we found one down in Oregon for like a little less than 500 bucks. With 90 day warranty on it. Wrong set of gears though. So he was going to have to use my gears and rebuild the new used ax axle. So I thought, well, hmm, that's a fair Christmas gift, isn't it? So he expected it was going to cost three grand, maybe more. So this truck, <laughs> I can never get rid of this truck because I put so much money into it. I'll never get it out. On the other hand, I'm running out of things to fix. Uh, that's risking it, isn't it? Knock on wood. So, yesterday I got the truck back. I didn't want to drive over here if I didn't have four-wheel drive. And the, that little Fiat is, they're supposed to be good in the snow, but it has, the Abarth has those little wide, low-profile tires. They're summer tires. <laughs> getting stuck over here in the snow and it's supposed to snow tomorrow on Christmas Day over here. So I said, Ugh, all right, just go ahead and do it. So we did. And this, this story is illustrative. I'm leading up to something. So it's a little Christmas story, kinda. So, uh, he calls me up and he says, your truck is ready, um, but I haven't gotten the bill yet, gotten it together yet, added it all up. So I went down to his shop and he said, yeah, your truck's 
doing well, I discovered what the problem is. If I can find the little doodad. It is a little valve. There it is. So it's this little thing. Oh God, now it's going to be really hard to see, isn't it? Probably isn't going to want to focus. There it is. Notice that it's all filled up with crud and corrosion and rust and crap. And it's like a little valve thingy. Right? So he thinks that this is the culprit. It's a breather valve. It's just a very simple uh, little valve in that it has a little ball bearing that when pressure is down below in the differential, it opens up and allows pressure to vent, but doesn't allow um, pressure back in, I believe, is how that works. Probably uh, a 50 cent part. <laughs> So that got all gummed up and corroded, and so he thinks that uh, the the gears in the differential spin, of course, and they create pressure, and that pressure has to vent out, and it will find a way to vent out, and what it does is often it'll blow the seal and the bearings, and then get rid of fluid. Now. It could have done that and I didn't know it. I don't check the differential every time I check my oil or something. You know, I should probably. <laughs> there was a day when I did. Um, so he thinks that's what happened. So he said, yep, totals $1,400. Wow, that's way better than we thought. So I was feeling ecstatic. I was feeling joy. Because in my head, I budgeted 3000 for this, thinking it could even go to 3200 or 3500 Who knows? At $100 an hour labor, it adds up fast. So, $1,400. I'm ecstatic. My point is, your sense of satisfaction about something is entirely based on your expectation about it. It's all in your head. It is all in your head. So, so here I was feeling ecstatic for just having spent $1,400 plus I tipped him a hundred bucks. It's Christmas. And he really did right by me on this. So, um, 1500 bucks total. So I just spent 1500 bucks, which would be like, oh no. But instead I'm ecstatic because my expectation was it was going to be 3000. So, um, you know, Christmas, I think for a lot of people is a time where they have a lot of expectations. You know, like, oh, we're going to have so much fun. Or the kids are going to love this. Or or we're all going to get along so great because it's, it's how it should be. And, you know, often it doesn't work that way. Uh, I remember Christmas Day at 3 p.m. as being the, the nadir, the bottom of the entire year. You know, you'd opened... Your Christmas presents and you'd seen the pleasure on somebody's face or not when you gave them a gift and by three o'clock when I was a kid uh, the adults were starting to get pretty loaded it was an alcohol day and uh, and it's getting dark and it's cold it's like the darkest day of the year almost and and all you have to look forward to is going back to school in a week or week and a half. And it's just grim. I hated Christmas. <laughs> I hated Christmas. So I'm smoking some uh, Cornell and Deal Star of the East in a tin. How old is this tin? Funny you should ask. This tin is 2012. 
January of 2012. So, and it's it's actually quite good. Um, it's kind of a big cut flake. It's got a nice moisture to it. Um, and it's tasty. It's like a heavy lot of Kia mix. It's hard to uh, keep lit if you're sitting here telling stories. So, so what I had to do just to make Christmas bearable is I had to kind of create my own um, traditions, you know. So, uh, so I make Christmas cookies. Uh, I used to work in natural resources. Now I work on the other side of the table in the development side. Yikes. So I'm not sure what I'd make. So I always made trees. Like little Christmas cookie trees. Mm, can't see that. How about that? Oop. Oh. I've eaten a few of them on the way over here. No, you sure? There you go. Okay. See? Little trees. So I make a crap load of cookies. And then I give them away. And that is so much fun. And it's a really old fashioned recipe that uses uh, sour cream and baking soda to leaven it and um, cream cheese frosting. So it's, they're really good, but. Uh, so that's my way, my little tradition, you know. Instead of buying people stuff, I'll, I take cookies around. And my dad was kind of like that, you know. He, uh, he would take bottles bottles of liquor around to his, he was a dentist, to his um, lab men or his, you know, just friends. And so as a little kid, I'd get to tag along with him. Um, often I wouldn't go in the house. I'd stay out in the car. But uh, when he made his rounds, giving out his bottles of liquor, you know, to his friends and his work associates. So... So maybe that's where I got that. I don't know. I think it's a good tradition. Stuff is good and mellow, but uh, hard to keep lit. So, oh yeah, something else. That's a little Band-Aid. So, yep, I got the first dose of the vaccine, of the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. So that vaccine is particular in that it, you know, has to be kept at minus 70 and then you have to unfreeze it and then use it like basically immediately. So first responders are on the A-list to get the stuff. And uh, so I'm a volunteer in my fire department. But I'm not on the front lines. You know, I started out as a firefighter EMT, but um, I just... Honestly, I was afraid it was going to harden me too much, you know. So uh, what we do, us older volunteers, is we drive the water trucks, the water tenders. And, and they need that hugely when they need it, and they forget about us the rest of the time. And that's kind of good, <laughs> you know, honestly. But... Uh, there are a lot of people who, uh, there's a lot of misinformation or disinformation or maybe correct information. I don't know. Maybe we'll all turn into zombies, um, or be biochipped. I think my phone keeps track of me plenty well enough that I don't need to be biochipped. But, uh, there's lots of information about the vaccine. And so some people are refusing to be vaccinated. And the fire chief is not willing to say, thou will do this. So, um, there were some openings at the last minute because this vaccine has to be used. And uh, so they said, hey, you want to get vaccinated? I said, heck yes, let's do it. So, at the last minute, uh, I got it. And it's just like getting a flu shot. There's, you know, really... It's not like this 10 foot long needle or anything. Um, normally I don't even have a reaction to the flu shot. Uh, occasionally slight soreness. So I had some soreness actually in the uh, shoulder joint. 
So there was a little bit of a response there. And I hear that the second uh, shot, which is the same amount, same formula, everything's the same, you just get a second one in three weeks. That's where a lot of people have uh, issues, you know, when those pop up. So we'll see. I feel personally super lucky to be within the first week. I managed to be in the right place at the right time and get a little vaccine. So, yay. Is it a government plot? I don't know. I haven't uh, had this desire to eat brains or walk around like a zombie, so I guess that's debunked. Um, the microchip, I can't tell, but I don't care. So, if it's good enough for a dog or a cat, it's even though that's a different kind of microchip. I'm making light. Some people are really serious about that. So, whatever. Believe what you want. Smoking a, uh, a no-name. Has a few fills in it, but wow, it's a nice big pipe. Nice big bent. Are you going to focus? <gasps> there it goes. Yeah. Very nice. It's a good smoker and has a nice big bowl. I like it. So, here I am over on the dry side of the mountains. So, I'll spend probably three, max four days here and then head home. Um, maybe do a little photo safariing if it isn't like frozen fog or <laughs> any kind of crazy conditions like that. So, it should be fun should be fun. I wish everybody a uh, happy Christmas, however you celebrate it, whatever you believe. Pipe smoking somehow has a sort of a Christmas element to it, maybe because there are those old uh, images of St. Nick with a pipe, right? So. <laughs> and a little tin of tobacco or something is always a good gift. <laughs> and moderate your expectations or manage your expectations that means just becoming aware of your expectations right like oh I'm kind of expecting this or when, when it doesn't happen realize you had this unrealistic expectation because anything that doesn't happen in reality technically is unrealistic <laughs> you know by definition so uh so it's good to just have that one step back so you can look at your response to things and and realize you have an expectation there and that might be an appropriate expectation but uh unhappiness and dissatisfaction is the result is entirely within our head it isn't somebody else making us unhappy it is our expectation that isn't met whatever that is and so it's on us to manage our own expectations so that we aren't you know wildly unhappy i think that's just my opinion <laughs> so take that with a grain of salt. Merry Christmas. 